Hello, welcome back to How Shostakovich Wrote His String Quartet Number 8. Today we are looking at the fifth and final movement. We are wrapping it all up today. And uh, before we start, I'll mention one last time that uh, these videos take a ton of time and effort, and so if you enjoy them or find them useful or anything else on this channel, really, please do consider subscribing. Uh, it's very much appreciated and it helps out the channel a lot. All right, let's get into it. So if a lot of the music here looks familiar, that's because it is. Um, very much of this music is from the first movement, which brings up kind of an interesting discussion about multi-movement form. Most multi-movement pieces are either three or four movements, and both of those amounts have very established structures in terms of dictating what purpose each movement serves. This is not quite as much the case with five movement structures, so it's much more open-ended, but to me, Having three really distinct interior movements bookended by two movements that share a lot of the same musical material, to me that's a really effective way to build a piece. I feel like it works really well here. Now that's not to say that there's no musical content that's unique to the fifth movement. Um, there is, and a lot of it is derived from this motif of a quarter note followed by two eighth notes and then another two quarter notes. And it's very uh, intervallically distinct and also is defined by its contour. So even if the intervals aren't always the exact same um, spacing, it's the contour is intact and the rhythm is intact, so it's, it's clear what the motif is. But before we get into all the uses of that, let's go ahead and take a look at the opening here. So the fifth movement starts with music that we first heard at rehearsal three of the first movement. Uh, originally, this music, all of this up to here, served as transition material. And it was a transition into the strange floaty music that was both in C minor and also obsessed with E natural, so two elements that would ordinarily be very much at odds with one another. Uh, instead, from the A flat here at the end of this first violin line, uh, the first violin ascends a half step to A natural, which is meant to dovetail into the viola, uh, who gives us another DSCH statement in the key of G minor. And so once the viola gets to its final movement, of its DSCH, the cello then gives us our first iteration of the, the sort of fifth movement motif. And the way that this motif usually works is that there will be two statements of it at the same transposition. So you can see here that these first two are starting on an F, and then there will be one more uh, given a step-ish lower, a diatonic step usually. Uh, and so you can see here, uh, this one starts on E flat, and that's usually the way that it operates. We can, we'll, we'll see that throughout the movement. Then at rehearsal 66 here, the second violin gives another DSCH, this time in C minor. Uh, and that's another thing that this movement has in common with the first, is that there's just a constant stream of these motifs in various transpositions. Now this one eventually becomes accompanied by the fifth movement motif, uh, but this time given in the viola. Again, uh, we can see it's given twice in the same transposition. Uh, this. A flat here is really just a little pickup into it. So twice starting on that B flat and then once more starting on that A flat. And all the while the cello is sort of just providing a sort of generic counter line, but it is very much uh, in counterpoint with the other two lines. Then after that, the first violin, uh, now with the mute off, has a DSCH in G minor, just like the viola up here. And the fifth movement motif is given to the second violin. Once again, we have it twice in the same transposition starting on F and then once a step lower. And so you can see the DSCH is just gradually moving up the ensemble as well as the fifth movement motif accompanying it also is gradually moving up. And what you may have noticed by now, what with these features being woven together in counterpoint in the way that they are, is that this whole section from the very beginning of the movement all the way up to, we'll say a little bit past rehearsal uh, 68, it's kind of a little bit vague. But this whole stretch of music here is a fugue, and the DSCH is being treated as the subject. Now we've had these staggered statements of DSCH before, but these ones in particular are given in the tonic, the dominant, then back to the tonic, and then the dominant again. Um, so you can see the tonic here with uh, the cello statement being given in C minor, then the dominant in G minor, again in the tonic C minor, and again in dominant G, which was definitely a common option for how to present fugue subjects uh, in, you know, the, the Baroque practice. The other vital element here that's missing from other contrapuntal sections in this work is that after each voice delivers the subject, they then continue on into their own individual line. 
Uh, no one is really joining forces with anyone else. We only get any kind of rhythmic unison across multiple voices uh, right here at measure 16 between the viola and the cello, but the violins are still very much separate from this and separate from each other. And another thing is that there's not really any harmonic grounding to speak of. Um, this isn't something that's exclusive to fugues, obviously, but it does move through harmonic areas in a pacing that's very similar to fugues with each subject introduction taking us somewhere else. So we have a brief break from the four voice texture, three bars before rehearsal 67 right here. We're left with just a few bars of the second violin and the viola just doing a few bars of counterpoint together. Now the pitch content, especially in the viola, seems to suggest A flat minor-ish, and that is further solidified with the fugue subject being given in that transposition in the first violin uh, after 67. And then we have a few sort of scattered iterations of the fifth movement motif. Like here we have a B flat one, but then it stops for a measure and then goes into a G flat one and then another G flat one. And then the viola has a G flat one. So it's not the same sort of format that has been in so far, but um, it's still uh, giving us various presentations of that motif. And then we have this really, really high subject in the cello here in the key of D flat minor. Uh, and again, the whole time this fifth movement motif has been being passed around and uh, eventually winds up in the first violin here where it does actually wind up in the form that we've been seeing where uh, twice uh, starting on B and then once starting on A. And then another important moment here, the texture sparses out once again right before 68. It may only be for three beats, but it, it is very noticeable. This changing in textural thickness is, is one of the main tools that Shostakovich is using to pace the music. We had a similar thing previously right before 67 right here, which I'm gonna circle again so we can just have so many things on top of it. You know, the second violin and viola are just kind of hanging out together. And this is really smart because with the sort of innate harmonic instability that fugues tend to have, using texture as your tool for pacing is a really nice way to keep things relatively consistent in terms of like emotional aesthetic. Now there are of course other things that you can use like rhythm and register and dynamics, but for this particular instance, uh, we have this really plodding elegy of an epilogue. Those things could potentially risk disrupting the very fragile emotional vibe that we have going on here. So let's go ahead and listen to all of that uh, from the beginning up to rehearsal 68 here. So once we're at rehearsal 68 here, Shostakovich begins to build the ensemble back up after this moment of uh, brief sparseness. And again, this is sort of serving as almost punctuation to phrases. Now the first violin starts to climb here while the viola gives us the DSCH subject in E minor, followed then by the cello in B minor. We have some crescendos here as the, the first violin continues to climb and then hang out in sort of this higher register. Now the fugal aspect of the music has effectively stopped. There's no more DSCH to be heard for quite a little while here, but the voices are still interlocked in counterpoint as they reach this very uh, climactic moment on the forte here. Now on the forte itself, it seems as though we are in A minor. From bottom to top, we have A, G, C, A, so sort of A minor seven, but that gets completely foiled by the following A sharp in the cello here, which serves as a leading tone to B actually, and then that drops down to E in a sort 
sort of so do motion twice. And a lot of the stuff here actually seems to suggest E minor with that being one instance. Another is the fifth movement motif uh, now in the viola here, which has a lot of important E minor notes, but also A flat as a tension point, uh, as well as the violins, which are resolving between these dissonant notes and then simply E and B right here. So there are these really dissonant halves of each bar here, and then they fall into a very simple E minor there. And it's kind of cool that the cello sort of punctuates that. It's it's kind of cool that the the B is the the dominant, and that's what's being held in the dissonant spot before dropping down to the tonic and consonant. So it's kind of a cool cool blend of consonant and dissonant function. And then right after this at rehearsal 69, this all just sort of wrenches itself into dissonance, uh, mostly having to do with the A flat and the cello here. And during this, the upper voices are oscillating between E flat minor and D minor, neither of which have anything to do with A flat. So A flat's a very dissonant bass note there. Now notice we've not yet hit a diminuendo. So all of this is very impassioned. It's, it's very heated. Then in a final DSCH statement, of the fugal section from the first violin uh, were brought up to a dominant harmony of G major, which actually has a lot of similarities to how G major was expressed in the first movement. And what I mean by this largely has to do with the viola and how it has had this really heated suspension on E natural, which is notated as F flat here, before dropping to E flat and then finally D, giving us something that actually belongs to G major. This E natural business happened a couple of times in the first movement, and it'll happen again in this movement actually. Basically how that was represented was there in the first movement was a dominant chord and the viola was holding a, a low F flat before moving chromatically down to the to the D and sort of resolving into that dominant harmony. I'll, I'll show it when it comes around in this movement. Then as the other voices uh, resolve to a stack of C's there, the Viola continues on the fifth movement motif. Uh, again, two iterations here, starting on B flat, and then one iteration on A flat, followed by a bar of silence. And then the second violin does the exact same thing, uh, but an octave up. So a very sort of static and, and empty feeling moment. And this second violin repetition brings us then into the final section of the piece. So let's listen from uh, rehearsal 68, where we're building up to this climax here, all the way up to uh, rehearsal 70 here. At rehearsal 70, after a half bar of silence here, we hear the beginning of the first movement unfold again, uh, this time with mutes and only very slightly altered. And this whole stretch of music all the way up to measure 71 here, this is all the exact same as the, the very beginning of the first movement. And so at measure 71 here, we can see that the fifth movement motif is in the viola here, which repeats it numerous times as it sort of unwinds and dies away in this diminuendo here. I think also the generally descending vibe of how this motif is usually presented with the, you know, the third iteration being given a half step down, I think that sort of contributes to its sort of dying away-ness, if that's what you want to call it, which apparently that's what I wanted to call it. So here we are. It sure is 12.30 a.m. Now this particular iteration of this motif, in terms of its transposition, puts a half step between the A flat and the G here. And we'll be reminded in a moment by what follows that this was also an important half step in the first movement was between G and A flat. So the viola unwinds on the fifth movement motif, as I said, uh, and the rest of the group sort of 
dies out as well and the viola then sort of spins out into half notes until it is holding this G here. And then the rest of the group comes in on the very last DSCH of the entire piece. Now the final DSCH unfolds in almost the exact same way as the final DSCH of the first movement, but there are a few differences. Um, one of those is that the first and second violin lines are swapped here. In the first movement, the DSCH was coming out of counterpoint that justified the second violin line being above the first. Uh, but obviously that's not the case here, so it, he went ahead and swapped them. Another big one is that instead of growing to mezzo forte, as was the case in the first movement, here we are going to all the way to forte. And the diminuendo after this is also delayed. So the forte stays all the way until this, this stack of C's and G just sort of swallow the earth. And once that happens, then he adds the diminuendo there. Now there are also just these lurches of dynamics, like these swells and performances are usually really, really visceral. And the first violin here then provides us with one of our previously important motifs, one of our important motifs of the first movement. And this is what I was talking about with the uh, G and A flat half step being important in the first movement. This motif of C, G, a flat G. And so it's a nice continuity thing that the final iteration of the fifth movement motif uh, was sort of emphasizing that half step. Now speaking of that half step, that's how Shostakovich chooses to end the whole thing with the first violin, drawing that out in these whole notes here so that it has a minor second clash with the second violin who's on this open G here uh, until it resolves down to that unison, uh, also giving us this enormous open fifth between these Gs and the viola C, but more so the cello C as well. Um, just these really large intervals. I also really like how Shostakovich doesn't give us an E flat here to make it decidedly C minor. Uh, it's already really obvious from everything that came before what the deal is here. And I think adding an E flat to make it a C minor triad is not only unnecessary here, but I think it would actually detract from the power of the sound that this open fifth gives us. So let's go ahead and hear this ending section from Rehearsal 70. All right, so there we have it. The intent of these videos was to help folks understand many of the tools and techniques that Shostakovich employed in order to help him write this piece and to help make clearer why it is that certain things work about this piece. Now, these techniques are things that become internalized in a composer and they're things that can help a seasoned composer like Shostakovich to write a piece like this in three days as he did. Now there were a number of instances in which I could have gone into more details on certain things, but uh, in an effort to keep things timely and not overly analytical, I tried to talk about the things that I think are the most important. If there are things that you wished I would have talked about more or things that you want to explore more of, then I would 
definitely encourage you to do so. I also wanna say that in my view, the biggest thing that can be learned from this piece is its conviction. I've said it a number of times, but it never tries to be clever at the expense of itself uh, in terms of expression and emotion, which is saying a lot considering how deeply emotional it is. When I was starting out as a composer, there were so many things that I wanted to write music about that were very emotionally important to me, things that were really difficult for me to put into words, but that I wanted to convey through music. But I simply didn't know how to do that. I was learning about 18th century harmony in my theory class and in my lessons and in almost every single resource I found online. You know, it was all about learning the basics. Um, and well, I think there's a decent amount of that stuff that helps me out today in terms of technique. It did not help me express myself back then. And it was really frustrating because I, I didn't understand how on earth learning all of the types of 6-4 chords and, and how Mozart implemented them was ever going to help me develop a compositional tool belt that empowered me to write about the things that I wanted to write about. So all of that is to say that I thought that doing these videos about compositional techniques that Shostakovich used uh, in this piece would maybe help some composers think a little bit differently about composition uh, and about emotional expression. And if this has done that for anyone, then I will have considered this to be a success. Thank you so much for watching this video and or this whole series. I hope that I've been able to help you learn about things that are useful to you, or at the very least showcase some really interesting music. It's music that I love a lot, and I hope that I've been able to share that with you in a way that is constructive. <laughs> uh, if you want to help support this channel, you can do so by subscribing if you haven't already, and uh, giving the video a like, and maybe checking out some of my other videos if any of those are of interest to you. Thanks so much again. I so, so appreciate all the support, and uh, let me know what piece or composer you'd like to see featured next on this series. I take my polls and comments very seriously, so um, just let me know. All right, see you next time.